Uh, okay. You ready to get started? Yeah. All right. Volume, volume and conversation, that, that's really kind of what, what we really want to have here. Uh, so we're talking today about combating med medical misinformation in the post-COVID-19 era. Um, I'm Josh Davis. I'm an ER physician from Wichita, Kansas. Um, Josh Nifaredos is uh, actually moving to, he's a faculty, he's moving to um, Baltimore. Um, and so he's actually not able to be here because he's working his last couple shifts before he moves. And then Ken Milne here, um, faculty uh, well-known, um, uh, uh, SGEM star uh, uh, for combating uh, misinformation and the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Uh, strongly recommend you check that out if you have time. Um, uh, Dr. Milne's on a couple boards, um, and so it does have some disclosures. Um, I'm open to have conflicts if anybody wants to um, come bribe me with anything. Objectives today are going to be to describe three logical fallacies used to perpetuate medical misinformation, differentiate medical misinformation and academic debate, list three ways to combat online medical misinformation, and then describe three strategies to approach patients who have um, beliefs or have been exposed to um, misinformation. So the first thing we need to do is to define misinformation. And so this is from um, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. So misinformation is, is false information that spreads regardless of intent um, that does end up misleading people. And, and so um, that's different from disinformation, which is deliberately created um, to harm or manipulate. Um, and so we're gonna be falling in the disinformation and misinformation uh, kind of arena. Um, but there's also malinformation, which is a separate topic that we're not gonna cover today that's based on fact, but kind of taken out of context. Um, again, also with the intent of misleading or harming or manipulating. And so, so we're gonna fo focus on misinformation and disinformation today. We're gonna use the term misinformation as, as the universal term um, uh, to apply to both of those regardless of what the in intent was. And we're not here to you know, suppose people's uh, intent. Um, as far as the history of medical misinformation, there's a long history of that. Um, some of the most more famous ones, um, does anybody know who this guy is up here? Wakefield, yeah, right. So led to led led, <laughs> led to Jenny McCarthy. Uh, he actually published. He was the one who came out with the uh, falsified MMR data and linked it to autism, which has led to a huge issue with vaccines. That's been even more amplified, kind of after COVID nineteen. Uh, some other famous um, uh, ones that we've seen. Um, there's HIV denier was the South Afri African president uh, Thibo Mbeki, um, and he basically said HIV was not a thing; it doesn't exist. And that actually is still a a misinformation myth that gets perpetuated on the internet. Um, you guys may have heard that COVID is also not a thing. It also doesn't exist. That's also, so, you know, it's not a virus. Viruses don't exist. That's another thing that's going around as well. Um, and all of these are founded in, in these kind of uh, misinformation kind of um, uh, uh, groundings. Uh, more recently, there's some COVID-19 misinformation spread by, you know, um, Brett Weinstein. Uh, he's a professor of evolutionary bi biology, Paul Merrick, critical care uh, uh, doctor, um, Joe Rogan, RFK. There's lots of people um, uh, that have um, kind of gotten uh, medical misinformation, but it's also important to recognize that like the medical field has also had a history of what we call, you know, medical reversal. Um, I think the most famous one being kind of the flecainide and enconide story, if you guys are familiar with that. So flecainide is, a, is an antiarrhythmic that we still use occasionally today, but it, it had a, an, an initial study that came out that showed that it um, reduced, it, reduced dysrhythmias um, very strongly. Um, and then subsequ subsequently, seven, several years later, they found out that the reason they were reducing the dysrhythmias is because more people were dying. Um, so they had less dysrhythmias because they were dead. Um, and so it, it became a very popular drug. And then we found this study that showed that it was you know, mortality producing. More recently, um, medical reversal, we can talk about hydroxychloroquine. I don't know how many of you practice at sites that used hydroxychloroquine for months in the initial kind of era of COVID, and then we had more studies come out that it, that it kind of wasn't. RID docs were pushing it for at least the six months that I recall, the first kind of six months of COVID. Steroids being the opposite, right? Do you guys remember way back in the original you know, COVID, they had some observational study that said steroids were associated with more mortality, don't use them, and then we found that you know, they have a... Um, a place um, in hospitalized patients to actually reduce mortality, which is kind of what you would expect in the underpinnings of science. So it's important to recognize, again, that there, there is a difference between uh, an academic debate and new evidence. Just be, when new evidence arises, it's not to say that something is misinformation, but we have to make the best decisions off of the information that we have. 
Um, so this can, <laughs> this can be exacerbated by rapid access to media reports of scientific information, which can misrepresent, misinterpret, or exaggerate scientific facts. So, so I'd encourage all of you when you are kind of looking at information, like news stories are not the, the place to go. Like the media can uh, misinterpret these. Remember that these are people in the media, just like politicians, that like they're responsible for a whole field and a whole um, uh, re representing their information based on what's presented to them. And they sometimes spit out facts that are, that are regurgitated to them and may be manipulated or spun in a certain manner. And so really, you should be responsible for being the one who's skeptical and goes to the results. Um, and then I don't know what's going on with this guy's thigh here. Like that's kind of, I, I don't know what muscle that is um, that's jumping out there on that right thigh. <laughs> um, but even more recently, this is exacerbated by social media and even more rapid access to unfiltered opinions and amplification due to the algorithms designed by the social media uh, to make profits for the social media companies um, and their advertisers, regardless of the truth. So here are some um, actually like federal examples of kind of things that, that were, you know, could be characterized as kind of poor messaging. You know, so this is the House Judiciary GOP. If the booster shots work, why don't they work? Um, and then also the US FDA. You guys may be familiar with the lawsuit that came out recently for this post that came up about you're not a horse, you're, uh, you're not a cow. Um, uh, and it's talking about ivermectin. Um, but realizing that like ivermectin has been used in human safely for many years, it probably, you know, just to say, you know, it's a horse pill is probably not the right um, uh, messaging there. Um, and it actually, again, misrepresents that ivermectin is actually a safe human medicine that's been studied for uh, uses. We just want to, um, you know, it's not been shown to be effective for kind of COVID would be the example there. Uh, due to COVID-19, the role of politics in medicine has become, you know, especially apparent uh, like no other time in recent history. Um, further exacerbated by messaging by public health authorities um, that kind of led to some distrust in the medical science and re recommendations. I think people, um, uh, some of the medical health authorities made some claims that were, that were a little more absolute than the evidence. And I said recognizing that evidence can change um, over time. Um, physicians also contributed to medical misinformation. So this study that I have up here um, looked at uh, was in 2021, and 52 physicians in 28 specialties across social media were responsible for creating um, or propagating medical, uh, the vast majority of medical misinformation in the early kind of COVID uh, pandemic. So over three quarters of, of it was done by these physicians. And then the other issue that we deal with now is kind of what we call the infodemic. So too much information, including false or misleading information in dis digital and physical environments, particularly during a disease outbreak like COVID-19, causes confusion, risk-taking behaviors that can harm health. And it leads to mistrust, mistrust in health authorities and can undermine our public health initiatives. Um, so as some examples, I, I think you all are probably familiar with this, but in the first six months of COVID, there were 24,000 publications done. Um, so no way for anyone practicing to keep up with 24,000 publications, even a whole like machine like the CDC, it, it, it's really asking a lot to keep up with that. Uh, and then there were also 20,000 preprints done in that same kind of um, time period. So that's over 200 articles every day. Um, so I don't know what your reading speed is, but I can't get through 200 articles every day, let alone like work a clinical shift and then also do that. Um, and that doesn't account for also the traditional media, right? So uh, in that same time period, there are 39 million uh, articles published in English language traditional media outlets, of which 1 million of them were, were kind of deemed to be uh, misinformation. Um, uh, and we know like information doubles every three days now instead of every, se every couple years, which is what it was, you know, uh, over a century ago. Um, so don't even get me started about like social media, tweets, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok. I don't know what the kids are using these days. MySpace, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> my MySpace is very up to date. Um, uh, what is it? WhatsApp. Oh, WhatsApp, yep, that's on there too. Uh, so it can be exhausting and overwhelming. So I guess the like question is, is why should you care? Like why, why should it be your responsibility to address medical information? Again, with it being so exhausting and like soul draining. Um, uh, and some of the things are is, 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 you know, it's in our Hippocratic Oath, it's in the AMA Code of Ethics. Um, uh, so uh, one of the things in the AMA Code of Ethics that, you know, a quote is, you know, a physician shall continue to study, apply, and advance scientific knowledge, maintain a commitment to medical education, and make relevant information available to patients, colleagues, and the public. Um, so, so it's kind of a part of our, our role as you know, physicians, and you know, educator is where a physician actually comes from, is as an educator. And so we have a, a role to, uh, 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 an obligation, I would say, to make sure that the, the public stays well informed. Um, and then it's also, um, there, depending on which version of the Hippocratic Oath you, you uh, look at, there's a handful of different um, uh, 
quotes that you may take, um, depending again, depending on which one you use. But I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm. Um, I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge, as is mine, with those who are to follow, to prevent disease wherever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. Um, and I will remember that I remain a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings. That's, those sound mind and body as well as the infirm. And then there's also some medical legal uh, implications as well. Um, so First Amendment rights um, in the Supreme Court of Planned Parenthood versus um, uh, Casey in 1992. For the physician's First Amendment rights not to speak are implicated, but, not, um, only, but only as part of the practice of medicine. So your right to kind of speak to this is um, uh, not regulated by the state. You, you have kind of free speech to do so. Uh, and then there's only a handful of instances where the government might have the authority to con con constrain or compel speech um, as far as health and welfare. Um, and that's, um, so to withdraw or refrain from public discourse in an environment where false and harmful health information is pervasively disseminated um, would be an abdication of the ethical obligation to make relevant information um, available to improve community and public health. Um, as medical and health professionals and physicians, we possess reliable and truthful information about the nature of health and the cause of disease, and it is our obligation to do so. I think the more um, compelling um, uh, uh, reason for me is, is, is are, are these kind of reasons, right? How many of you have seen someone who it, it ends up intubated on ECMO in the ICU um, for, for some you know, medical misinformation, they didn't get vaccinated, and then, and then they have a kind of severe course, or they end up on dialysis from take, taking too much hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, um, or you know, patients getting measles now that, that we really shouldn't be seeing, which many kids will do just fine with measles, but the kid in your class with leukemia or you know, some other immunocompromised state um, may not fare as well, and, and it's just a travesty to see things because of this kind of misinformation that kind of propagates. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Millen to give you some of the practical tips now that I've given you some of the background. Thank you. Yep. I don't know if I'm in combat mode today, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, we wanted to give you some idea of how you could combat medical misinformation. And the, the game Mortal Kombat, when is that from? What, what era is that? Does anybody know? Because I don't. It, it didn't happen in the 80s. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, so... Um, you know, when you go on to, and we're going to be talking about social media here, uh, when you go on social media, it's very similar to um, being in real life, knowing your audience. I'm here today, and I know that I have pre-med students here. I have practicing physicians here. I have maybe retired physicians here and residents here. And so you've got to know your audience. And if you were writing a love, love letter, you wouldn't address it to whom it may concern. Right? You'd be a bit more targeted than that. And so when you're dealing with misinformation, you've got to know who the audience is and who you're actually engaging with. And so uh, a lot of the time, uh, at least in my experience with engaging on social media, there's a lot of logical fallacies. And so um, because uh, SAM said we have three objectives, or we had to have three or four objectives, one of the objectives was to know logical fallacies. So there's the slide. Checkbox. All right, but I love talking about logical fallacies and cognitive biases. Um, one of my favorite ones is, um, uh, uh, to do this one, is when people will throw out an anecdote, right? And so they'll, they'll say, well, it worked for me. Okay, I don't invalidate pa uh, patients' experiences, because usually, remember, there's usually a human being on the other side. It may be a bot. But, um, but they have a backstory and they have a life and they're a patient and I always come into it with sort of that feeling and framing of, okay, that's what happened. You know, you had something, you did something, something happened after that. And people put that together as a post hoc uh, fallacy and give it as an anecdote. And that can be very powerful. And you'll see this in a lot of even traditional media saying, hey, you know, like at the end, there has to be a disclaimer. This is my personal experience. It worked for me. I don't invalidate their experience, but I do question their interpretation of what happened. I don't, you know, okay, that's what happened. I'll start with that. I accept that. But why did it happen? That's what I want to get down to. And so I won't invalidate their experience. Does anybody else have a logical fallacy they like besides ad hominem attacks? Come on. You know a logical fallacy? Yes. Well, the idea of attribution. Just, just yesterday morning, a black cat walked across my shadow, and I had a terrible day. Exactly. 
exactly. I'm a Taurus. <laughs> we're skeptical. Yeah, exactly. Well, and everybody knows that trauma is a much worse disease than cancer. What's that? Sorry? Everyone knows trauma is a much worse than the full moon. Yeah, and the Q word, right? All these superstitions right. and stuff like that. And that, that's called confirmation bias, right? And so if somebody says the Q word, that part of it is confirmation bias. There's yeah. another one. There's also regression to the mean, right? If it's really quiet, and the mean is here, and if the volume is here right now in the department, guess where the volume is going next? Yes. Oh, yeah, anybody say the Q word, the, the place goes to hell. Well, of course, it's called regression to the mean. And so we have to have really good ability to pick out fallacious arguments. Next thing I want you to know is, what's your goal when you go on social media to talk about misinformation and disinformation? Is it to get a number of followers? Is it to get on CNN or Fox or CNBC or MSNBC? I don't know what all your stations are down here. But, you know, is it to get, because they want you on if you've got a lot of clicks, if you've got a lot of hits. Um, if your um, thing is to um, engage with people and educate people, fine. But you also have to realize you're not going to reach everybody and not everybody is reachable. And that's okay. So a lot of the times, people will go, Ken, why are you spending your time engaging with this person? A, they're a person, so I, I think that they have a base amount of, um, I, I have a base amount of respect for them already. But it's also for the people watching the interaction and saying, you know what? You don't have to be a jerk online. You don't have to be a dick to be misogynist about it. You don't have to be that way. You can disagree without being disagreeable. And you can have an engagement where you just stick to the key point and you don't engage with the tone. And they can throw all the ad hominem attacks and usually they call me a shill for big pharma or something like pharma, pharma. I grew up on a farm, so I am big farm. But um, I'm not big pharma because I don't take anything. And if anybody knew me, I don't think the pharmaceutical companies, especially the people that make, I don't know, thrombolysis, really hold me dear to them. You know, oh, that Ken Milne. That's why they wrote a letter to um, ASAP once. Genentech wrote a letter to ASAP about me. Um, yeah, so they don't really know me or my backstory. So you got to know your goal. Also, know the rules of the game. And again, if you want to reach a wider audience, if that's your goal, if it's not just a vent and catharsis and stuff like that, if you want to reach a larger audience, if you want to have an impact with misinformation and disinformation, um, add a picture, add a meme, add a GIF. Humor is difficult, though. So humor is difficult, and it can be misinterpreted a lot. And so it's usually safest to make fun of yourself. Right? It's usually okay to be self-deprecating, and sort of the approach I use is never punch down. You can punch up, but don't ever punch down. What's that? What do you mean? Give examples. So I, I will, I will uh, be happy to take on um, a large multinational company um, and uh, be very skeptical and critical of them and call them out, but I'll be a lot gentler with an individual who... Their, their loved one just died of COVID, you know, and if they had only gotten ivermectin. I won't be the same way necessarily as I will be interacting with a large multinational corporation yeah. online. Yeah. You know, and, and because it usually those, you know, you start with, I'm very sorry for your loss. You don't start with, ivermectin has nothing to do with it, blah, 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 right? You just, I'm very sorry for your loss, because I am. That's where it starts. We're both human beings. We need to connect. It's called social media. I think one of the other rules, too, is, is the algorithms in, in social media. So acknowledge that by interacting with someone, you are propagating whatever posts they put there, and you're actually giving them more. You're moving them up in the algorithm to get more seen in that. Yeah. So the more you interact with that person on that thread, the more it moves up uh, in the algorithm because it's having activity on it. Um, yeah. And so just realizing that, that, again, going back to knowing your goal, if your goal is, is to do that, you're, you're much better off publishing or writing positives of, on your own yeah. um, to combat misinformation than engaging with things that you disagree. Or you can quote tweet them and stuff. Um, but I do tend to engage with these people, and I know it moves up the algorithm. But I, people go, how, long, like, how come you not just lose it, Ken, with these people that are so being so angry and upset? A, I don't take it personally. And none of my positions define me as a person. My positions are separate from who I am. 
And so that's easy. And then I can show that you can spend a long time. And you know, my wife sometimes says, how, how do you not get upset? And I'm like, I work in an emergency department. <laughs> My expectations are really low because I don't have to fall very far. And if something nice happens, oh, wow, isn't that lovely? So I frame my expectations. But you're absolutely right. I mean, these algorithms are set up for dopamine hits to encourage you to engage and to give you what you want. Also, I don't do a lot of blocking online. Um, I've blocked zero patient, people, sorry. I, I, I haven't blocked anybody online. Um, and part of that, and I respect everybody can set boundaries, and boundaries are good. Um, and I encourage people to do that. But my point is I don't want to live in an echo chamber and get that dopamine feedback and, and, and all of a sudden think I'm smarter than I really am because I'm not. So, um, And then be humble and empathetic. And that's an ethos I try to uh, in, my, in real life but also online. What you see is what you get. This is me. Right, the nerdiness, the goofiness, the science stuff, um, the Star Trek, the Batman. That's Ken. that's Ken. I am Kenuff. <laughs> Some people think I'm a lifeguard. I just do beach, just beach. Um, thank you for getting the joke. And for those of you who don't know, my wife's name is Barb. It's very meta. Um, but you know what? Be humble, right? You know, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, there's two possibilities. One, you are, so change rooms. Surround yourself with people that inspire you and make you better. And two, you're not the smartest person in the room, right? And so I'm in this room, I know Chris Carpenter is the smartest person from my perspective in this room that I respect the most. And I'm always trying to get in his room and follow him around to every academic meeting I ever go to just because I want to be near people that he engages with, because he engages at such a high level, and I learn so much from him. So um, be humble and be empathetic, be kind. You know how much you know about someone? This much. Everybody has a backstory. They're like an onion. They're like an ogre. They're like a parfait. Everybody loves parfaits. But you know, like there's something behind their behavior usually. So you just have to listen long enough and carefully long enough. And um, as Ted Lasso would say, um, be curious, not judgmental. Can and I then, yeah, we got one more slide, and then you can ask a question. Because I just he just went like this. I don't know if you saw this up front, but he just gave no right here. He just gave me the finger. So one is I don't identify with my positions, right? If my position on the use of TXA for nosebleeds doesn't define me, okay. And when somebody comes after you, um, listen to what they're saying and try to reframe it. We've got some stuff about how, how to say, you know, like, I don't know. I'm comfortable with saying I don't know. I'm comfortable with being fallible. I'm comfortable with changing my position when presented with new information. And also recognizing what sets you off. And so if somebody comes at me, and says something negative about Star Trek, I'm gonna get maybe a bit triggered. And then I'll step back and take a moment because in the time that the question is asked or the statement is made, and then I have a response, there's space. And in that space is the time to breathe and reflect and consider what you're going to say. And then finally, know when to stop. How apropos. Uh, uh, but this is just basically social media is designed to suck your time and energy perpetually. You could do it as a full-time job and, and still not kind of do that. Um, so, and many of the disinformation experts have learned to capitalize on the cognitive biases and, and the logical fallacies and psychology in the same way that the social media algorithms have in order to make it um, uh, more engaging and, and suck you in. Um, so for your well-being, you have to have guidelines about when to stop and end a conversation. You don't have to block someone, but at some point you have to realize it's not productive, it's not meeting your goal, you don't need to kind of do that. So we do have a couple examples that we don't have time to go through, um, but... Um, we go through questions and yeah, why don't we do that? And, you know, we had, we had examples and questions, but I'm more interested in what your questions are. That was just a prompt us in case nobody puts up <laughs> their hand, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So go ahead, please. But so often I find that um, people draw an association between healthcare workers in Canada and the government because we're publicly funded. And I'm wondering how you create a separation between the two. Because I think there's a lot of animosity and, and 
most of time is down towards government. Um, and some of that is reflected in you know, inflation and corruption. So. Which means they can actually say you're an elected official. Like, essentially, they're like, well, you are being funded by the government. Obviously, you have to follow their guidelines. You have to follow what they're telling you to tell us. So since it's a Canadian question to start with, and then I'll give Josh to maybe give an American perspective. Uh -huh. Um, from my standpoint, um, yes, uh, it's a socialized healthcare system, um, and they're complaining about uh, maybe administration. I share their concerns, and I and I stand shoulder to shoulder with patients because I'm on team patient, and I want to make the system work better. And there's system problems, and I'm happy to continue to try to improve the system so patients get the best care based on the best evidence. Um, but when it drifts into politics, I avoid that. So that's one of my triggers. Um, I, I don't directly uh, tweet, I don't tag politicians, and I don't get them involved in the conversation. And if I've been dragged into the conversation by being tagged or stuff like that, I don't participate in that conversation. Because I don't, I, I'm not a politician, I, I, I'm not a bowler, but I stay in my lane. You know, what I'm good at is critical appraisal, taking care of patients, you know, advocating for patient care. I think that's my role. My role is not a politician. And other, and just because I'm smart in one area, this is another thing about being humble, I don't have any expertise in the other areas. Just because I'm right about something doesn't mean I'm right about anything else. And so I take that humble approach to, I'm not going to engage with them, and uh, they're working on a different set of rules and game. it's just not me. Other, and, but if other physicians feel that that's their role, and they've got expertise and want to engage with that, that's fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in the American healthcare system, we're, we're a little bit more detached from the government. I, I think the one thing that I do to, to help uh, reinforce that, at least with patients, it's harder to do over social media, but at least with patients is, is like I can identify with them like, hey, like I know like the healthcare system sucks. Like I know insurance sucks. I know your access to primary care, like you're not gonna get in. Like, and I give them tips like, you know, for example, like, you know, when you need to get your sutures out in a week, like call today to make the appointment for next week because they're not gonna get you in today, tomorrow, the next day, they might get you in next week. And if you can't do that, you can come back here uh, and you know, and, and that kind of thing, or like you know, I under you know, uh, you know, and explaining to people, I, I think that that distances me a little bit. Is recognizing again, and, and we're in a different system, so it's a little bit easier for us to distance ourselves from that. We we get a lot more of the pharma shill uh, stuff in in American uh, healthcare, and and that's not really our emergency medicine specialty, but I think physicians overall kind of get that because it does. It's pretty pervasive in some of the other specialties, uh, not pharma shill, but pharmaceutical funding. Uh, so I think we. Oh, go ahead. One, yeah. yeah. Uh, happy 28th birthday, Ken. I thought if I kissed his ass enough, I wouldn't get uh, called out. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for your time. This is our contact information. We love to talk about this stuff. So if you're interested and want to reach out, this is, uh, this is our, our jam, uh, and we love this stuff. Uh, neither of us have perfected it either, um, but we're more than happy to engage with this stuff. This is what we love to talk about. And even, if it's a question, a comment, you want to hook up, or if you just you know, want to chat about it more, we'd love to. So the end.